Okay, so before we dive into the class from this week, I just wonder for all of you who were here last time, and I believe that's all of you, um, are there any lingering questions or is there anything that really stuck with you from the last class that we had? I know it was two whole weeks ago, so it might feel like a lifetime, but anything that's sticking with you? I just thought um, that was a remarkable group of people asking great questions, getting great answers. I found it really inspiring. Yeah, the discourse, all of the questions asked last time were, was really profound and really powerful. Thank you, George. I really like the continuum of uh, what was God like at this time in this passage in what was just said, because it really expanded what that is God. Yeah, God is such a big concept that to have different modes, modalities to kind of connect with God is really important. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna make it a little bit easier on you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. And actually what I'm gonna do just to kind of um, get us to remember a little bit of what we did the last time is you might remember that we went through a few different slides. One of things that we know about Judaism and we talked a little bit about a variety of different things that we connect with Judaism. We also spend some time thinking about what we wonder about Judaism. Um, and there were such great questions on this list. You'll notice that some of them are in bold. That's because today's class is going to be um, touching on some of these questions. It might touch on a few other things too, but primarily it's the things in bold that this class will kind of be talking to. And then last time at the very end, I asked, what is it that we learn um, or that we learned from last class? And these were the answers that everyone offered, that there's many dimensions of God to explore, that God is one, that everyone receives Torah in different ways, and indeed we'll continue with that later. Um, that there's multiple truths, that God has lots of names, that Yisrael means wrestling with God. You can read through all of these, but really talking to the depth and the breadth of spirituality and God. So as we're looking at this list, is there anything else that, that people want to add to it? Or any questions that are kind of lingering around it? Uh, I think one thing I learned from last session is, interestingly, I'm used to studying the Bible from a Christian perspective. This seemed to be less about the literal meaning of it and more about reading in between kind of the lines and really looking at, I guess, the implications of every sentence and every word. Yeah, I think that's really, really true. And we're going to talk more about that today because Torah is a big, big part of our focus this evening. Thank you, Caitlin. I just want to invite anyone that whenever you want to say something, please unmute because I can only see four people at a time or maybe five people, depending on how well my computer is behaving. So that means that if someone raises their hand, I might not be able to see it, but I certainly want you to be able to ask questions or give comments. If, it, if the question comes to mind, but it's not directly on topic, feel free to send me a message that way. 
and I'm getting messages that internet is unstable. So I'm really hoping that's not gonna cause a problem. If it does, send me a message as well. Internet around here has been a little funny the past two days. Okay, so um, just also a reminder that here we strive to create a safe learning environment that values and supports curiosity and discovery that honors Other person who's wondering the same thing and who will appreciate the answer. And finally, that this is a place that is safe, open-minded, and non-judgmental. We're here just to be in sacred community with one another. Last week, we talked about this image of the rope that's tied together. And there's an idea in Judaism that there are basically three strands. One strand is God and spirituality. That's what we we're talking about last time. One strand is Torah and values. That will be our focus for this time. And obviously you cannot cover Torah and all Jewish values in an hour and a half. So obviously it's a snapshot, just like God and spirituality can't possibly cover that in an hour and a half either. Um, and the last one is Israel and community. And when you put these three strands together, that's when you have something that's really strong. That's when you have really the core of what Judaism is all about. So today, one of the big things that we are going to talk about is Torah. And when we hear the word Torah, we might wonder, what does that really mean? So like, if you hear the word Torah, what comes to mind for you? It's honestly kind of confusing to me because I know Judaism has a lot of different books, right? There's um, the Torah and there's the Talmud and I think there's another one and I'm not quite sure what the difference is between those. Awesome. So you're absolutely right. There's a lot of different Jewish scholarship. And if you've never heard the word Talmud before, don't worry. We will get into all of that later today. But when we think of Torah, Torah could refer to this thing that we're looking at right now, this Torah scroll, which contains the five books of Moses. That's Torah with a big T. So this is the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These five books are contained in this scroll that we call the Torah. But um, in addition to Torah with a big T, there's also Torah with a little t. And that little t Torah is encompassing of all Jewish wisdom. So that's like what you were talking about, Caitlin, the Talmud, which is basically commentary on the Torah and on Jewish laws and even custom. Um, a lot of things that rabbis have taught, um, all, all of these uh, apocryphal texts, um, all of these different things come both, both the uppercase and the lowercase. And what's the difference between the Torah, the Talmud, and the Tanakh? Okay, great question. So the Torah is just the five books of Moses that I mentioned before. The Tanakh is actually, um, it's a shortened word that stands for Torah, Nivim, and Ketuvim. So it includes the five books of Moses, that's the Torah, the Nun, the, the um, Nivim, all of the prophets, all of the books of the prophets are contained within the Tanakh. And finally, the Kituvim, the writings, that's things like Proverbs, Psalms, and so on. When you put all of those things together, then you have the Tanakh. The so, Talmud, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay, so the Tanakh is basically the extended Torah, and the Talmud is commentary on the Torah. Yes, right? in, okay. a <laughs> in a nutshell, that's exactly what it is. And I'll show you a visual a little bit later of what the Talmud looks like and what the Talmud is made up of. We will get there, just not quite yet. 
but really, really good questions. Okay, sorry if I'm dropping out at all. It's an internet problem solely. So hopefully it won't cause too much of a problem. Um, just looking at the text. Oh, so I know that sometimes people refer to the Torah as the Old Testament. And that is partly true, right? We Jews share these books along with Christians. The challenge with calling it the Old Testament is that an Old Testament implies that there's a new, better Testament. And so calling it the Old Testament can feel sometimes a little offensive to do. And so usually we don't refer it to it as the Old Testament. Um, I really wish the internet wasn't having a problem, sorry. Um, Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. good. Yes. Fabulous. Um, just reading through the chat over here. Awesome. Okay, so there is a question about prayers and when we say them. That that's that's a great question. It's a little off topic from here, but I'll try to see if I can come back to it a little bit later. Um, the Hebrew Bible. So when we're talking about the Hebrew Bible, that's a really good question as well. Um, what we're referring to is, yeah, we're referring to the Tanakh. That's totally fine. You can absolutely call it that. <laughs> the original. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, okay, so so here we are, I'm bringing us to Talmud, and this is the commentary based on the Torah. Now, this might feel a little intimidating just looking at this. There's a lot of Aramaic and Hebrew over here, and even for those of us who might know some Hebrew, it might be hard to even make out any of the letters here, but I'm trying to give you an idea of what a page of Torah, or what a page of Talmud truly looks like. Is the Torah always present in the form of the scroll? That's a really good question as well. Um, a Torah, when we read from it on um, like Friday night or Saturday, and I'll go into that a little bit more later as well, it is in the presence of a scroll. That said, you can eat, they sell, you know, Hebrew Bibles, they sell Tanakhs where you can read through it. Um, so in that way, it's not always in the form of a scroll because you can always read it from a book. It's just not used ceremonially. Um, so if we look at the Talmud, you'll notice that right in the middle of a page of Talmud, there is a text and that there's lots of different texts that are written around it and even smaller texts that are written outside of that. What essentially happens is that there's something called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is commentary on the Bible and on Jewish traditions from around the second century. The Talmud itself has something called the Gemara. And you could see maybe there's three, two letters there, a Gimel and a Mem, that stands for Gemara. So that's the rabbinic commentary on the Mishnah. And this is from um, third, fourth, fifth century rabbis who are writing the commentary and basically disagreeing with one another. Um, it, it's basically the Talmud is a bunch of rabbis debating anything and everything because there's so many different ways to have customs. And if you look at the text outside of it, these are rabbinic commentaries based on the Talmud text and based on the Mishnah text. And then outside of it, you have later commentaries based on the earlier commentaries and the Mishnah and the Talmud. So that's layers upon layers of just trying to figure out the meaning behind things. Um, it can feel a little bit intimidating looking at it, but it actually is quite powerful because what it means is that we ourselves can actually continue adding to that commentary. That in each generation, there's new understandings based on our experiences, based on our learnings, and that we can add our layers of knowledge onto the layers of past generations. 
This is what a I silly. Oh. Yeah, go this, ahead. This is a silly question, but does the Talmud ever get like updated? <laughs> so I that's a really good question, actually. So the original text in the Talmud, they don't, right? Those stay exactly the same, but there's always new commentaries and ideas coming out about it. And so in a way, it keeps expanding outward. So in a way it does change, just not the original texts. Um, on the right, I included what I thought was such a funny thing that a rabbinical student put together, um, trying to give an idea in English of how the Talmud works. Basically created a Mishnah about what it meant to make an appearance on Zoom, as if the rabbis were talking about that, and then Gemara expanding upon it and having various commentary on the outside responding to those things, just to give an idea of really how this discourse works. Um, so they called it Masechet Zoom because each section of the Torah is Masechet something. That means chapter, chapter whatever. Um, I'm not going to get into everything that's on a Talmud page. There's plenty to learn about that. I just want to give you a feel of what that's all about, because the, the core of it is that we are in conversation with one another, is that there is no one right way to interpret anything. The fact that we have volumes and volumes of Talmudic books where rabbis are debating everything shows that debate is healthy. Um, there's an idea that there's majority opinions, meaning the majority of the rabbis agree that such and such is the right way to, let's say, light candles for Hanukkah. There's a majority view of how you light candles on the holiday of Hanukkah, how many candles to start with and how many candles to end with. And then there are some rabbis who say, no, that's not the way to do it. You do it the complete opposite way. And both are right. One might be more common, but both are right. So being able to uplift that and to recognize that is really, really important. When was the last contribution change the Talmud made? So in the text itself, you'll notice here that the most, um, the most modern addition to a typical volume of Talmud would be the um, Rabbi Akiva Edgar, this small commentary down over here, he lived in the 18th to 19th century. There hasn't been anything formally added to Tom because a page is only so big, right? But there's tons of commentary that is constantly being added in other forms. Any other questions on this? Okay, well then I'm going to take us into another piece of this. So Torah is so important to our tradition in order to study it, but it's also important because it, we learn how to kind of live it. What does it mean to live Torah? And one of the values that comes up in the Torah so many different times is the value of Shabbat. And so today we're going to be studying some texts around Shabbat to try to figure out why that is so important, what Shabbat has to offer. And so I think um, everyone should have gotten an email that had a text sheet on it. We're just going to be going through those texts right now, um, one by one. And essentially after each text, we're going to be asking these questions. What does this text teach about why we celebrate Shabbat? And what does this text teach about how to celebrate Shabbat? So would anyone like to read this text for us? I'll read it. Um, Thank you. So, um, completed now were heaven and earth and all their host. On the seventh day, God had completed the work that had been done ceasing then on the seventh day from all the work that God had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy and ceased from all the creative work that God had chosen to do. Okay. So as we take that in, we're going to ask, what does this text say about why we celebrate Shabbat and also how? 
<clears throat> going back to our last um, lesson, um, we mankind is created in God's image. And so in this way, we are we are reflecting God, what who God is and what God did. So um, God did all this work. He created the whole universe in seven days. Like we can finish our work, plowing the fields or writing that email and take a, take a rest. Yeah. So we take this day of rest because we in God's image need to rest as well. And like, have you had that experience? of taking a day and shutting off and saying, I just need this day to rest. Yeah. I'm like, what has that felt like? I feel like when I take those days off, I feel like it's kind of this low key stress in the back of my mind. Like I should be doing something um, or I'm procrastinating or I need to work. Yeah, so I mean, there can be that. Sometimes there's a lot of anxiety, right? Like, how do I take a day and not work? How do I take a day and not do this whole long list of things on my to-do list, which is a mile long and I'm never gonna get to it. And what's really interesting is that people who really keep Shabbat figure out ways to balance that, right? And then if you worked super hard to make sure that you're prepared for Shabbat, then it's easier to let go of all those things because you kind of have that plan going in. So you get in a rhythm of working for six days, resting and focusing just on God and Torah, whatever it is, and then going back to a six day work week. I think- Anyone else? Yeah. I think there's a wisdom to it, not necessarily only the, the religious explanation to the uh, one day off, but there's also a health-wise or mental or physical. If you keep on going and non-stopping, then you can run yourself down to the ground too fast. And so you have to mentally recharge and physically too. So it's like an um, old, old wives tale or um, old wives remedies that we don't think of that they will work and they do. Yeah, we can't be as productive if we're constantly working. We need some recharge, perhaps. Yeah, and, and along those lines, though, I wonder. Um, oh, I guess I'm. I didn't want to cut anybody off there, Richard. That's okay. Go ahead, James. Um, as as far as I can see, a lot of it hinges on the definition of work. If work is the activity you do to sustain your life, it may not be the most enjoyable activity you perform. In fact, many of the people I know, the work that they do or did before they retired was not exactly the most pleasing thing to them. But I noticed this says that, um, that uh, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy and ceased from all the creative work that God had chosen to do. Now. I like, uh, one of the things I like to do to relax is to paint like that silly thing you see behind me and this one as well, but that's creative work. So God ceased doing creative work and that shouldn't be done then on, on the Sabbath either, I guess. Is that true? According to this text, that's what we could read from it. That is one thing that could potentially be read from it. <clears throat> We're going to go to different texts so we can kind of grapple with that. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Richard. And, and and for me, it's, you know, it's like my work is never done, right? And then, and um, I'm always feeling guilty that I didn't get done what I wanted to get done. And there's always more in my planner and it's so absolutely overwhelming. And for me, this is a reverence to God. It's like, oh my God. God, you know, look at what he did. He made the world and all of creation in, in six days. And then he said, rest. Well, it's, it's a reverence to God. It's, it's kind of a respect to God um, to say, you know what? If you could do all that in six days, I got to give you a day. And so for me, it's actually giving that day to God and giving thanks. Um, and I, I wish I did it um, with any regularity. What I see here, yeah. I'm sorry. 
No, go ahead, Gail. Okay, what I see here is God has completed his task. And the only way you can enjoy it now is to sit back and appreciate the work that you have done and reflect on what has been completed. If you just keep at the ground, if you just keep grinding and grinding and grinding, you never really understand or appreciate what has been done. It's kind of that opportunity to look, but it's also the chance to nourish ourselves in a different way. Just not working actually nourishes you, it makes you slow down. And it gives you time to contemplate. I always think that, or my current thinking on it is that, that Shabbat is where you nourish yourself and you enrich yourself. I mean, God might be having a wonderful time watching us. He's not creating and doing this and that and the other thing. And it gives us the opportunity to do that, to enrich. It's not a bad idea to think about just what you did accomplish in the previous week. What worked, what didn't work, what made you happy, what made the world happy, and then use that to restart for the following week. If you didn't do that, then whatever um, road you were on, you would just continue walking around that road without looking about where that road was leading. Uh, can I have That's a word? This is a... Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I grew up in the Orthodox tradition and it's more, it's more specific than that. It just, uh, it, there's things you can do inside your house that you can't do outside your house rules laid out something like you can't carry cash, you can't carry keys, uh, you, uh, you can move your furniture around in the house because you're not changing any, the condition of anything, you're just relocating it, but you're using physical strength to do it. So it gets down and you, you could turn, you, you could turn, not turn off a gas jet on a stove because you're changing the condition of that, of, of the fire. So you Turn it on before you, when you cooked your Friday night dinner, and then you turned it down to a simmer and left it on for the next day through Shabbat at sundown. The, the rules like that. Uh, and unfortunately, the thing that, that upset me with the rules, there was always workarounds to the rules. And uh, that, that, that's what frustrated me. But that was the orthodox version of, uh, of what you could do. You, Right, so it's a little bit, um, so when we're looking at this text, this original text from Genesis, there's no indication of any of that, right? Right. But where those practices come from, um, because it says to cease doing all the creative work, right? And so the rabbis ask, this is Talmudic, right? The rabbis ask, well, what does that mean? What are we allowed to do on Shabbat and what aren't we allowed to do? And what they did is they looked in the Torah at the activities that were involved in creating a tabernacle, a holy place for the community, and said all of the things that were involved in creating a tabernacle were not allowed on Shabbat. Since some of those things including, included having a lighting a flame, then all of a sudden lighting a flame in any sort of a way wasn't something that you can do, which is why electricity, turning on an oven, driving a car are things that couldn't be done because they required an ignition. But that's based on Talmudic thought that then was slowly modernized when there was such a thing as electricity. Um, but that's not how all Jews observe Shabbat. It's certainly not the only way, but it is definitely a Jewish way to do that. So I want us to look at a second text, and this comes from Exodus. Would anyone like to read this for us? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the Sabbath day is a Sabbath of the eternal, your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, or your cattle, or the stranger who is within your settlements. For in six days the eternal made heaven and earth and sea, and all that is in them, and then rested on the seventh day. Therefore the eternal blessed the Shabbat day and hallowed it. Okay, so is there any difference between this and the text before it? Oh, uh, it's very specific. 
like it tells you what to do basically like just everybody is except exempt from labor um and you can't make animals do the labor for you or anybody else uh i do remember i'm in another class and we talked a lot about what it means by your male or female slave. We didn't really like that too much. But basically, it just says, like, don't do work. And the stranger within your settlement, like your employees, for example, shouldn't be allowed to do work either. Right. How do we how do we get around this slave mention? We have to kind of see it for the time in which it was. Um, the idea of slavery here it's not a good thing. Slavery is clearly not a good thing. <laughs> um, this is not the same kind of American slavery that like we had in our country. It's a very different type of slavery. It was not nearly as brutal as that. Um, but like what it really meant was the people who work for you, who live in your home. It, it was a slavery, but you have to remember that in the Torah, there also were ideas that um, people would be freed every so many years. Um, so it's a different kind of slavery, but we can't fully get around it. it. It's what it was at the time that it was. This was put down on parchment or on animal skin um, many, 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 like thousands of years ago. And so it was yeah. a very different time than today. But this, this concept of having a day off was remarkable in its time when it was created. I mean, people just didn't have days off. They worked every day of their life. And this, to have a day off was something really special. And it probably had uh, attracted a lot of people who, to, to Judaism, uh, at least in part by this concept. Yeah, Chad Ha'am once said that more than the Jews have kept Shabbat, Shabbat has kept the Jews. That it has given us identity in so many ways. Um, Rabbi Cassie, um, I think that it's really important that this this sec segment says something about how holy the Sabbath is. It's like introducing the concept of uh, spirituality and and the sacred, and that we're not just uh, animals and people who labor and do creative works we also have a belief in something greater than us and that holiness is really key to the Sabbath. Mm, so this reminder that there is something more important and having that focus, I, I think that's incredibly well said, Judy. And there was a question in the chat I'm realizing about creative thought. There is never ever any problem or restriction on creative thought. I know in that first text, it was talking about not creating, but that meant more specific like labor with creating. It didn't mean thinking. Our thinking should never be hindered. The, the interesting thing to me about this is it, it, it does not say at all what you should do. It only says what you should not do and you should not work. And you shouldn't let anybody around you work. But it doesn't give instruction at this point at all about what you should do. Um, and that's fascinating. That is absolutely true. And we're going to go through a few more texts and we'll see if that remains the case. Any other comments on this one before I move on? Well, it, it increased the time, uh, the men at least, to go to synagogue. They had a day that they could spend hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they not if, have to worry about getting back to it. Yeah. What if work is something that somebody enjoys it and they don't take it as as a work, but well, joy? Right. That goes back to our our main question, right? What is work? And it's a really difficult question to answer. So we're learning little bits and pieces here. And the thing is, if the rabbis have volumes and volumes of Talmud where they're arguing about every fine point, then it's okay if the people in this room believe different things about where, how work falls into that and what is meant by not doing work. 
But let's look at a few texts around it to see if it can kind of help us with that question. But it's a really important one, Natasha. Okay, so this is part of the blessing on Friday night called the Kiddush. And Kiddush comes from the same Hebrew word as Kadosh, which means holy. This happens to be a blessing that we say over grape juice or wine. And this is what that blessing is. Would anyone like to say it? Yeah, I will. Thank you. Praise to you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who finding favor with us, sanctified us with mitzvot. In love and favor, you made the holy Shabbat our heritage as a reminder of the work of creation. As first among our sacred days, it recalls the exodus from Egypt. You chose us and set us apart from the peoples. In love and favor, you have given us your holy Shabbat as an inheritance. Praise to you, Adonai, who sanctifies Shabbat. Okay, so what does this prayer teach us about why we celebrate Shabbat? I think it has something to do with um, pointing out that we care about our lives and our, our world around us. It's not just that we go through the motions. It, it's saying, um, you chose us, set us apart from the peoples. We're saying we care so much about what you've given us that we're going to sanctify this day. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but yeah, it's about caring uh, about your life and what what God has given you. And relating to that, sorry, relating to that, there is a Jewish concept of hidur mitzvah, doing something to the best extent to really take that extra attention and put it into a holiday. So to use like the best wine you have for Shabbat or to have like your best meal of the week on Friday night, for example, in order to really uplift that and show your care. So I think that's a beautifully said. Sorry, who wanted to say something? Um, I, I just, I'm, the more I learned about Judaism and um, just the fact that it's been done for thousands of years that Shabbat has been, um, celebrated its its heritage and that um just how long <laughs> it's been happening and and I think that's wonderful it's such a core part of tradition it's absolutely true what do you make about the mention of the exodus from Egypt in the middle of this prayer I think it's, um, I think they now want to specify the fact that they were slaves for so long and didn't have a chance to relax. And now they have to remember that they're chosen people and they're not slaves anymore. They're, therefore, they're allowed to take a day off. <laughs> Perhaps. So when we were in Egypt as slaves, we didn't have the ability to worship God this way, but now we do, and so we should take advantage of it. And that kind of links in with the previous one where it said, don't make your slaves. We were slaves in Egypt. Now we get the chance to keep Shabbat and you know, worship and take the day off. We need to make sure that those in our care also have that kind of time. Yes, beautiful. Thank you, Jill. I think that during COVID, um, I personally learned to appreciate the creation more by just observing it in my yard or in the house when before I was busy during the week and weekends and never took quite as much time to, in the attention to what's been created. Yeah. And sometimes if we give ourselves that gift of time, 
we can actually perhaps grow our gratitude for that which is right around us all the time that maybe we've been too busy to really fully appreciate. I know I'm guilty of that sometimes. Okay, so I mean, there's, there's a lot of power in this prayer. And there's a lot of different <laughs> springs here. Yeah. I thought someone was saying something. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on to this next text that we have, um, which is a little bit longer, or actually a lot longer, um, called from Manucha and Malacha in observing on the Sabbath in Reform Judaism. So Rabbi Mark Wachowski, the, the Talmud, it's not changing what it originally was. We can add commentary to it, but it's not changing. What happened at some point is that people all over the world said, okay, great, I have this Talmud, I'm reading the text, but there are things in our world today that weren't true when the rabbis were around in the third and the fourth century. Like we can think of lots of things that are different today than then. So there's lots of questions that come up. For example, how, like what, what is this that we're not supposed to be doing on Shabbat? What is work, right? That's a question, that's a later question. Can we drive a car? Well, there weren't cars at that time, so that wouldn't have come up in that moment, right? Electricity, all these kinds of things. But it's other things too. It's really anything you can imagine. It's how do I take these discussions from years ago and how do I make them make sense in today's world? And so there's something called responsa, where basically someone who has a question about how to really, um, acknowledge and give due respect to the tradition, but at the same time, try to figure out what does it mean to keep it today? Um, they'll write a question and send it to Mark Wachowski, who is the head of the response committee for Reform Judaism, or the Union, Union of Reform Judaism. So sometimes rabbis will send in questions. What is our what is our stats on um, the COVID vaccine? Should people be getting it? Should people be getting it in certain circumstances and not other circumstances? What should we be doing here? What does the Torah have to say about these very modern things? And Mark Wachowski will sit down with a committee of people who will then try to figure out, okay, what is our answer here? Where can we find bits of wisdom that might be helping us to shed light on this modern situation? So Mark Wachowski wrote this, based on what it means to observe Shabbat in these times. Rabbi W. Gunther Plout, for example, defined Shabbat as a form of protest against the endless struggle and competition that characterize week, workday human existence. The prohibition of work, which he defined as the abstention from every activity that could be considered usefully competitive affords the individual the opportunity for self-fulfillment, doing nothing, being silent, and open to the world is sometimes more important than what we commonly call useful. Rabbi Arnold, Jewish law on Shabbat is not measured by the expenditure of energy. It takes real effort to pray, to study, to walk to synagogue. There are, they are rest, but not restful. Forbidden work is acquisition, aggrandizement, altering the world. On Shabbat, we are obliged to be, to reflect, to love, and make love, to eat, to enjoy. There's a second half to this, but I want to just pause here. Any comments on this first part of this text? I love it. I really like, love it. It's because <laughs> this is exactly what I think. Um, I mostly talk to my Jewish family about my questions and stuff. And when I asked about Shabbat, they said, 
Shabbat should be a reflection of how you view your life in the messianic age. And when I view my life in the messianic age, I view myself with my family, spending time with my family, spending time with my partner, um, playing video games with them, playing board games with them, um, drawing, knitting, doing the things that I love that I usually can't do because of work, because of school. And that last sentence on Shabbat, we are obliged to be, to reflect, to love and make love, to eat, to enjoy. It's basically like, a commandment it's our it's a mitzvah that we're given to go enjoy the world that god gives you like don't hold yourself back on these little pleasures you know and i really like that because that's exactly how i view what my personal shabbat should be beautiful thank you caitlin rabbi how is performing a good deed, for example, working at a soup kitchen to feed others on the Sabbath. How is that viewed in Judaism? Is that considered that's, that's wrong? Because, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it definitely depends on what Jew you ask. If you, and it also depends on what specifically you're doing, right? Um, one is that even the most traditional Jews or the most Orthodox Jews, I shouldn't even use the word traditional because traditional implies that that's the original way to do it. And as we're learning from the Saving a life. If it's gonna do something that might preserve a life, that is the most important Jewish fact. You there uh, is. You froze a number of times. Terms of really meant for something else. And there are people who say, like famously, um, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marched with Martin Luther King Jr. when they were in Selma. You know, they, they were marching together. And about that, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, that he was praying with his feet. So for some people, do, we're working at a soup kitchen, doing this kind of things is actually a sacred religious experience. And if that's the case, then perhaps for you, that actually is a way of, of observing Shabbat. Excuse Shabbat. Me. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Rabbi, you know, it, it was an agrarian society primarily. And of course you would not let your, your milking cows go without being milked. And you would not let somebody go hungry if they needed to be fed. So, you know, I, 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 that's the, the view I would take. Yes, exactly. So why don't we go to the second half of this? Would anyone like to read this piece? And Rabbi Eric Yaffe emphasized the value of Shabbat observance for our stressed out, sleep deprived families. Our tradition does not instruct us to stop working altogether on Shabbat. After all, it takes a certain amount of effort to study, pray, and go to synagogue. But we are asked to abstain from the work that we do to earn a living, and instead to reflect, to enjoy, to take a stroll through the neighborhood. These writers, among others, point to the continuing relevance of the Torah's instructions concerning Manaka and Malaka. Our Sabbat, our Sabbath, they remind us, truly cannot be Shabbat unless we take seriously the demand that we rest and abstain from the work on that day. Thank you so much, Caitlin. So any comments or thoughts on this? I'd like to tie this one to the, uh, to the other one at the beginning where it said it's an act of pro protest in the first part and then in the first part of this, it mentions our stressed out, sleep deprived families. I was talking with my mom a couple of days ago about like, she was like, I'm, I'm for work. I'm not about work that oppresses you. And we think of the past and biblical times and slavery, the Jews escaped slavery. And I feel like uh, there's a slavery of the mind these days. You know, we, we take that work. There's no eight hour day in, in certain 
career in most careers you work on an office you take the work home you're you know you're on you're a slave to like uh you know your email and those alerts that come up and you're trying to like manage you have to like actively manage that to uh to relieve of your, yourself of that stress that's like actual work they have to do and so yeah to to take all of shabbat and have that be restful mindful you know there's a lot of work in the modern era around mindfulness and rest and yoga all, the, all of these things that are trying to like alleviate all of this the oppression of work and stuff so um that's i guess it's it's that the oppression of work is eternal <laughs> and so uh this that this ancient practice as it were is uh is very hip and very now is unsurprising <laughs> I think what this says is, in, in simplistic terms, stop and smell the roses. There's so much. There's so much around you, and just take time to enjoy. But when when you're talking about the actual time, I mean, by the time you sit down to Shabbat dinner, have a dinner, and that's usually the time to reflect on the week, and you get through, and then you get you, you're there, and you have some evening, and then you get up, and then you're you're in synagogue for two or three hours. Uh, you get home, and before you know it, it's time for uh, evening prayer. And uh, you know, it, it, it's it's a rhythm, and uh, and it goes by really quickly. And everything around you is, uh, if you're living in a neighborhood like I did in Brooklyn, everything was closed. I mean, you couldn't go uh, and do some of the things that you can do. In, uh, so it, the rhythm and the uh, uh, and and, and what the family did as a team was uh, everybody had their role to play, uh, even the kids. And so it was uh, remarkable. And everybody looked forward to it. It wasn't like it was, uh, oh, it's a hardship. I can't go to my uh, local whatever. And I know I can't watch a ball game or whatever. It's, uh, it's, it's a, something that's mentally very, very satisfying. Yeah, they can be. There's so many different ways of keeping Shabbat, right? That's what we're learning from this, is that in essence, Shabbat is about having this day, having this gift to be, to be with the people who we love, to do what we couldn't do otherwise. And that might mean going to temple and spending a lot of our day in temple. It might mean going for walks in nature. It, it could mean any number of things. But it's the essence of just this idea of Shabbat that we try to go back to. There's a, one final text that I want to bring, and this is called Sabbath Prayer. Um, would anyone like to read this text? I'll read it. Thank you, Judy. God help us now to make this new Shabbat. After noise, we see quiet. After crowds of indifferent strangers, we seek a touch to touch those we love. After concentration on work and responsibility, we seek freedom to med meditate, to listen to our inward selves. We open our eyes to the hidden beauties and the infinite possibilities in the world you are creating. We break open the gates of the reservoirs of goodness and kindness in ourselves and in others. We reach toward one holy, perfect moment of Shabbat. Is there anything new we learn or can reflect on from this prayer? I love that the you in there is capitalized. And for me, that means that God created the infinite possibilities for us to be obligated to enjoy and reflect upon um, and take part in. So I love that capital Y. Mm -hmm. That just jumps off the page. Beautiful. I think um, for me, people, us, we're a work in progress. And so we really haven't completed things in six days. We do it in a lifetime. 
And if we did nothing but that work on becoming whatever, whoever we're gonna become and didn't take a day a week to replenish ourselves, to nourish ourselves. And, and I'm not speaking specifically about a meal or two or a hala or family. I'm talking about replenishing our souls and nurturing ourselves so that we can continue to, to create, to work, to become. I always, I feel like it's, we're a work in progress. I feel our Shabbat is a, Shabbat is a work in progress. I, I feel a lot of gratitude for it. I found so much power in everything you said, but when you're talking about Shabbat as a time to nurture our souls, that's such a profound thing, right? And there's so many ways in which we might nurture our souls. And the thing is, it's different for every one of us. And that's okay. Yeah, a lot of times I feel like a, a hamster in a hamster wheel. And, and sometimes you just got to be forced to get out of the wheel to actually see where you are. And it's in the stopping and the emptying that you actually then really get to move forward to to restart you know the the rega the begin again is you know it's such a foundation in in judaism um and to be thankful you know sometimes you just have to stop in order to say thanks um and push the reset button so thank god for shabbat indeed yeah are there any lingering questions or comments that people have about these texts that we were just going through. I do. Yeah, please. What if, um, just like Sunny said, if uh, what if you can't stop? What if your jo either job are, is so important that you can't have a Shabbat at that time? Or what about mother work? You know, they never stop really. Some fathers too, but you know, and it's not always pleasant, <laughs> a pleasant job to do. That's true, right? It, it doesn't always necessarily need to be only pleasant things that happen on Shabbat, right? Because that's not that's not the world in which we live. Um, but yeah, sometimes really hard decisions need to be made where people have to decide, is this a job I wanna take if I need to work on Shabbat? Or is there a way while doing this work where I can find a way to be able to honor Shabbat, even if it's not the traditional way. Absolutely. Um, there's lots of different ways to understand that. But we know as human beings, we know that if we work around the clock every single day, and we don't have a chance to rest, that our souls suffer, that we become less productive, that we might not be as happy because we just need that as human beings. And so there, there's an importance in figuring out a way to observe Shabbat. And if it's not exactly the traditional way or if it doesn't exactly fall within the hours of where Shabbat is, okay, maybe some creativity is needed. But uh, the idea there, I, I think is worth preserving. So what I want to do now is kind of give a virtual synagogue tour. Some of you have been to a temple and have been to Temple Bethel many, many a times, and you could give this little virtual tour that I'm about to give. And some of you really haven't had a chance to spend time in a typical Shabbat um, inside of a synagogue. And so this is just to kind of give a little glimpse of what that looks like and to talk through some of the symbolism involved. So the synagogue really is a place that has many different purposes. One of them is a Beit Midrash. A Beit Midrash is a place that we learn, a place that we might study texts or study Jewish ideas, study Jewish values and customs and so on, but that we keep expanding our minds and keep on learning because that really is a huge part of what it means to even be human. A synagogue is also a Beit Knesset, which is a house of gathering. 
a place where people can get together just to socialize and to be, to forge friendships, to enjoy a meal together, which we one day will again when COVID allows us to, and where we can do acts of social justice together, social action, like in this picture as people are making a blanket to give to um, people in the hospital. And of course, it's also a bait to feel la, which means a place of prayer, a place where we can offer ancient words of prayer to God that Jewish ancestors did long ago, and a place where we can offer our own prayers from the heart. So I'm giving us a little um, tour of our temple, and this is Temple Bethel with its beautiful architecture on the outside and a couple of people making their way into the synagogue over there. And what happens when you come into the temple is you come into this kind of open area where people can sit and they can talk, where people can just be. You'll notice that off to the um, left of the picture, the right of someone entering, there's a table and on this particular table, there happen to be prayer books. And we're gonna look at that a little bit more in a second. Over to the right, you might notice as well, um, there are memorial plaques. And what happens is on the one year anniversary or on actually whatever year it is, on the anniversary of a loved one's death, we turn on the light to remember specifically that person who had died on the anniversary of that week that we're saying services. And this is an idea of what a memorial plaque or a yard site board looks like. One of the other things, of course, in the synagogue, and some of this might be very basic for many of you, are kippot and yarmulkes. Um, these symbols that many people wear on their heads. In traditional circles, in like orthodoxy, generally a man is the only person who would wear a kippah or a yarmulke. Both names are totally fine. Kippah is the singular, kippot is the plural. So that's why I'm saying kippah instead of kippot. Um, in our synagogue, whatever gender you are, you are welcome to wear a kippah or you are welcome to not wear a kippah, whatever is most meaningful to you. Wearing a kippah actually wasn't something that came from the Torah, it was a later tradition. And it relates to just making this symbol, whoops, uh, making this statement of, of when we're wearing a kippah, perhaps feeling that much closer to God um, by wearing it, that, that it's like a symbol of connection to God wearing something on our body. Similarly, a talit or a prayer shawl can do just that. Also in Orthodox circles, generally it would just be a male who's wearing a talit. Within our reform community, anyone of any gender is allowed to wear a talit, is encouraged to wear a talit. And on the talit, there are these strings that come down there are like four corners, what, what we call seat seat. That's the strings at each of the four corners. And there's lots of knot, knots, whoops. There's lots of knots and it adds up to 613 knots on the talit, which stands for each of the 613 commandments in the Torah. So it's like wrapping ourselves in Torah whenever we put on a talit. Any questions about that, about any of that? The, what about the, the box and the arm wrappings? Yeah, so you're talking about to fill in. I didn't include this in here, um, but right, it is another really important symbol that traditionally isn't worn on Shabbat, but could be worn for prayer on other days. So what it is, is it's like a leather box that you wear on your arm and wrap it around your arm a certain number of times and then wrap it around your fingers in a very specific way so that it actually looks like a shin spelling out that actually it looks like Shaddai, which is one of God's names. 
that will be spelled out. Other wrapping that goes around and inside these boxes are scrolls on which the Shema prayer that we studied last week is inside of there. So that's what that is. And it's another really powerful symbol. We don't generally have them at temple because we generally have prayer on holidays and Shabbat. And those aren't times where one would normally wear tefillin. Do you normally wear tefillin and, or tefillin and like prayer shawls on high holidays then? On high holy days, because it's a special holiday, you wouldn't wear tefillin, but oh, you okay. could wear a talit. Okay. So tefillin are only worn. And there's all sorts of reasons. Uh, could you repeat that one more time? They're only worn on? On weekdays. Okay. That are not holidays. So like just when you're praying like on days not on Shabbat or holidays. It's just kind of everyday prayer. The other Jewish holiday. Okay. Yes. Can everyone hear me? I think I froze for a minute there. Okay. Um, so I have a picture up here of our synagogue. This happens to be with our youth choir having a good old time over there and the canter in front. Um, and there's a lot of different symbols that are in this picture, and there's gonna be even more in the next one. Um, one is this whole area with the raised steps over here is called a bima. Bima is Hebrew really for stage, but we try not to think of it as a stage because that sounds too much like a performance and prayer is never a performance. It's a way to connect with God, it's very different. Um, on the bima, um, on, on this, this special area, you can see that there's this um, kind of stand that holds the candles for Shabbat that could be lit. Um, and that, of course, is a way to welcome in a Jewish holiday. You also see this big wooden area right here, which is our ark, inside of which is a Torah scroll. So, oh no, I didn't put that slide next. We will go back to that in a little bit. Um, before I mention the prayer books, so within our temple, we have something called a siddur, which just means prayer book. Siddur is a Hebrew word for, for order, like seder, like we have on Passover. So um, it's a way with which we offer our prayers. the words of that with commentaries, modern commentaries and older commentaries based on the Torah. That's what a homash is. And over here you see Mahsor. These are specifically High Holy Day prayer books. These are for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So those are prayer books that we use during the service. And then after services, we come in our social hall for Oneg, where we enjoy some food and just being here with one another. This is a picture from an adult program we had at Temple last year, but it gives an idea of uh, what an oneg might look like. So let's go back to sanctuary, this holy place and kind of how it's designed. There's lots of different potential ways that a sanctuary can be created. You'll notice here, there's a podium that's right in the middle on the left picture. And that's where a rabbi or a chazan, a cantor, would stand leading the prayers. And then you would sit lots of people around in a circle. There's different kind of traditions in Judaism and in many Sephardic traditions, meaning Jews from Spain and different parts of the world. Um, the tradition was to create a circular space and to have a prayer leader in the middle, as opposed to temples like ours, where the ark and the bima are in front and people are seated in pews behind them. And here's another example of exactly that, of the bima up here 
Um, here is the ark with Torah scrolls in it. And here is a podium where the service leaders will lead from. Yes. What is the difference between a temple and a synagogue? Good question. Technically, there is no difference. Sometimes people use different terms to refer to different denominational buildings. Sometimes people will say a conservative for Jews. They're just using different words. Um, the word temple in particular is not a word that um, Orthodox Jews would ever use for their worship space because the idea was that Jews did have a temple in Jerusalem long ago. It was destroyed. Another temple was built and that too was destroyed. And since that main temple that was the home of the Jewish people for so long had been destroyed, nothing else can be called a temple until another temple in that spot is rebuilt. That, that's kind of a, a more um, Orthodox view on that generally. Whereas Reformed Jews say, we have little temples all over the place. We don't want there to be a third temple in Jerusalem rebuilt. We want to have our temple in whatever community we live in. So that, that's a little insight into that. Great question. One of the other really important symbols is something called the Ner Tamid, which is an eternal light. It's supposed to be a symbol of God's eternal presence. And you can see how there's many different ways to have an air tummy. There's this little light in this synagogue, this huge kind of fixture with the Jewish star and all of these ornate kind of designs on it. And then if you look at our temple, this is our kind of ark opened with our Torah scrolls inside of it. And our air tummy is really kind of interesting. It's like waves with different colors. George, I bet you can say more about this. I can from all of your work on the building campaign, yeah. but it truly really is beautiful, isn't it? Yes, and there's also a ship. Yes, uh, as a symbol of of the sea where we are, and this um, eternal light that has waves. Beautiful, yeah. So you can see how there's lots of different ways to include this near tummy, this eternal light, but the symbol remains the same. It's a light that never goes out. It's a reminder that no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through, God is always there with us. It's a really, really powerful statement and symbol, I think. What is the significance of the different Torahs, the different scrolls in your ark? Yeah, so you'll notice here that um, some of them are in their regular year round um, kind of covers and some of them are in their high holy day covers because of COVID, we didn't fully ever change all of them over this year because we really haven't been in the temple. So that's why you're seeing different designs that are there, that's not typical. Um, we have different scrolls. This big one, the second one from the left is actually a Holocaust scroll. It's a Czech scroll that we use that whenever, um, at the age of 13, people can become bar mitzvah. It's a coming of age where they read from a Torah scroll and all of our bar mitzvah kids read from this Holocaust scroll. Wow. It, it's a real powerful statement of we are here, we are thriving and we get to read from this scroll just like people did way before. And our other scrolls, the reason you have so many scrolls is because especially during the High Holy Days, you need to move from one reading to the next reading pretty quickly, and they're from different scrolls, so you need to have a few for that reason. But there's not a specific significance beyond that. Any other questions about these symbols or these images? What about the, um, the, the accoutrement? on the uh, Torah scrolls, the, like the shield, the, the like the Torah, there's like metal Torahs on front and crowns and other stuff. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of symbolism to our Torah scrolls. So um, in ancient times, when there was a temple in Jerusalem, 
there was someone who was a high priest and the high priest would wear really involved clothing, um, which would include this special vest and a crown and all of these other kind of accoutrements. And so when we're looking at the Torah scroll, essentially what we did is we took the idea of what the high priest was wearing going in to talk to God on Yom Kippur, and we took those items and turned them into dressings for a Torah scroll. So it's this connection to holiness that dates back to the priest going into the temple. That's really what's going on there. So these metal kind of shields in front, those are, that's the breastplate. That, that's a special metal kind of piece that the high priest wore, and it had symbols of all of the 12 tribes of Israel on it. And you'll see that some of these do have that as well. Um, the crown, just like the crown that the high priest would wear, um, this kind of cover was like the gown that the priest wore under his vest. There's multiple layers like that. Any other questions? Um, I guess it's kind of a curious question. So how do you guys, I guess, come into possession of so many Torahs? Because I understand that it's a very labor intensive, painstaking process to, I don't want to say manufacture them because they're not manufactured, but to kind of craft them and to make them, right? It is very labor intensive. And actually we, we can talk about that now. Here's a picture of uh, our Torah school kids reading Torah and kind of looking at it and studying it. Um, but here we go. So so um, the scrolls, are written on animal skin. They take animal skin, there's a long, long process of turning that animal skin into a paper kind of um, thing that could be written on, a parchment. And then someone who's a scribe, or in Hebrew, a sofer, actually painstakingly writes every single letter in the Torah. If they make a mistake in a word, there is a way to have it dry and then chip it away and then rewrite that. And there's a special way in which you put the ink together. Like it's, it's a very meticulous process. Everything has to be perfect. And in fact, let me see if I have a close up. So if you look at this scroll, for example, you'll notice as much as you can see it, that each letter has extra little embellishments on it. If even one of those little embellishments is off, it needs to be fixed. So it takes a long time. There can't be mistakes, period. So they have to keep going back and making sure it is absolutely perfect, waiting for the ink to dry before doing the next section. It takes a long time to do those five books in this way. If a scribe were to mess up on writing God's name, they would have to take that entire piece of parchment out and would have to bury it because it has God's name on it. Um, so it's just, it's super, super involved. And because of that, it is very, very expensive to get a Torah scroll because it requires all that work over so much time. So generally it's something that happens slowly. Procuring a Torah scroll is a really important, really significant thing. I don't know exactly how the Torah, how the congregation came to get all of the Torah scrolls. I only know about the Holocaust scroll. I don't know if uh, George, do you know? Yes, there is one other that we had uh, a Torah created for children and the scale of it is smaller. And through donations, we were able to raise money to create a Torah just for children. And I also have another question. Maybe this is more so about don denominations, but I'm assuming grief form Judaism is you get if you guys created like a Torah for children it's more hands-on focused I would assume right well the, the way that it like you can't touch the Torah scroll because yeah, you need to use it yeah and your could you know yeah so you use this metal thing called a yad in order to read 
Um, the children's scroll, my understanding is that it's so named because it's a little bit smaller yes. and because children can actually hold it. So it's a little bit easier to use. We, in our Torah school, in our religious school, we teach younger kids to read from Torah so that they have practice by the time they become a mitzvah. So that's really what it was created for. And it's, it's beautiful, beautiful scroll. What kind of, what kind of animal skin is used, do you know? It, it depends. Um, I mean, it could be like goat skin. It has to be a kosher animal, obviously. Cow skin, often cow skin. Izzy, I know this is probably a, a, a stupid question, but I have to ask it. Um, so if the animal is killed, is that, is that how the skin is procured? My understanding is that like, Um, partnership that's worked out between sofares and butchers so that they'll get the skin. It's not that the animals are killed solely for the skin. Mm -hmm. And there are people who say, like, we need a vegan Torah. And there's all different things in the works to make that possible. And that's kind of interesting as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is an ancient tradition that's been done for a long, long time, right? Um, and there are some videos about exactly how that's done. It's, it's fascinating. What I wanna do also is because reading Torah is a incredibly important part of our worship on Shabbat is to actually chant just a little bit from the Torah to give an idea of what it sounds like for anyone who hasn't had the chance to hear it before. Thank you, Dan. Found a video, wonderful. Um, so I just wanna chant a little bit. This happens to be from the beginning of the 10 Commandments and it's picked because this weekend on Sunday night, we are starting a holiday of Shavuot, which is the anniversary of the day that we received the Torah from God. That is what that holiday is all about. And so we read the Ten Commandments as a kind of reenactment of that gift. So just to give you an idea of what that sounds like. And if you look at this Hebrew, this is basically how things look in the Torah, although this is a little cleaner than would be in the Torah. Usually there's a lot more of little embellishments over several of the letters. Um, but there's no vowels anywhere in a Torah scroll. Imagine reading English with absolutely no vowels appearing there whatsoever and needing to figure out what the words are. That's what a Torah scroll has. So it requires study. It requires kind of going over it uh, many times to make sure that mistakes aren't made. And whenever anyone is reading from the Torah, there's always someone who serves as kind of like a checker um, to correct any mistakes that are made because it's so important that these words are said correctly. Any other questions on any of this? Why, um, why, why are some of the, I can't read this, but like the space. So why is there a space on the first and second line like that? Yeah, good question. Sometimes there are specific spaces um, and sometimes it can actually be um, almost poetic. If you look back to the last, where was it? Yeah, if you look back here, right, the picture on the left, you'll notice mm -hmm. there's tons of spaces there. Right. In this particular case, this text is Shirat Hayam. It's the waters, it's when the um, seas parted and the Israelites were able to go free out of Egypt. And the way it's written, the reason it's written like that is because it's supposed to actually simulate the waves of the ocean going over one another. So sometimes spaces are poetic like in that case. And sometimes it's to make it easier to see a certain text. 
So like this mm -hmm. first line here, there's a space, and then it says, by Deber Elohim, Akol Hadiparim, Ha'ela Lemor. So it's saying, and God said all of these things saying, and then the Ten Commandments begin. So there's a space in between God's words. It's like, we're getting ready for the Ten Commandments, people. Here's a space. Okay, here they are. Space, and then they're all listed. Um, so it can be used for a lot of different reasons. Or to mark a separation. There actually are specific rules. Like when one book of Torah ends and then another one is about to begin, there needs to be a very specific amount of space between the end of one book and the beginning of another, a specific amount of space um, between like Torah portions, because each there's 54 Torah portions um, corresponding roughly to one a week. And sometimes there are double portions, obviously, because we have less than 54 weeks in a year. And there's also holidays that take up some of those weeks. But there's 54 different Torah portions that exist. And each one of them, there's a little bit of a separation before it to be able to easily find it. I'm just looking at my notes really quickly to make sure I'm not forgetting something that I wanted to mention. Okay. Um, since the Torah is such an important part, whoops, too far. Since the Torah is such an important part of our tradition, when we read from the Torah, like there's a whole ceremony that takes place on Shabbat around reading Torah. We say some prayers. We take the Torah out of the ark. We bring it down to the congregation. People in the congregation kiss their hands and touch the Torah. Granted, all this was before COVID. It's going to be a while before we can do things like that again. But um, it's this idea of showing love and respect, reverence for the Torah. There are Jews who believe that the Torah, the words of the Torah came directly from God. And there are people who believe that the Torah, generally Reformed Judaism, um, teaches that the Torah is really a way, or, or it's a text that speaks to the Jewish kind of evolution and connection with something bigger than ourselves. So we might not believe that this text, that the words come directly from God, but we do believe that this is our people wrestling with God and that that wrestling is a blessing. So this text is so important that we might kiss it. We might um, do all these special rituals around it. We say blessings before we read from a Torah scroll and after we read from the Torah scroll. We offer, when someone becomes bar mitzvah and they read from the Torah, we offer a special blessing right then after they complete their first reading from a Torah saying like how blessed it is that you've become bar, bat, or brit mitzvah. So this just, it's one of the most central kind of parts of our tradition. One last kind of slide I had on here, just who to expect when you go to a synagogue or who's there. And that's a rabbi, someone like me, uh, a cantor or a chazan, someone who leads typically the musical parts of a service, a Jewish educator, office manager, teachers, um, youth advisor, maintenance workers, security, board of trustees, committee members and volunteers, and of course, members of the community. And really it should say guests as well because everyone is always welcome. Any questions on any of this? Um, are you guys going to have service this week via Zoom? And is it open for anyone or do we have to pay dues? Everyone is welcome to any service. You are always very, very welcome. Um, and we have services every Friday night at 7 p.m. And if anyone wants to just send me a message and I can make sure you go on our email list so that you can actually get the links for everything going on in Temple and you're welcome to come. Um, so that's absolutely open. This particular week, because of Shavuot, we also have a special service at 4 p.m. on Sunday, welcoming in that holiday. And we have six of our teens 
who are becoming confirmed. So after you become a mitzvah, you study a few more years and then you can have a confirmation. And we have six teens who will be doing I go back in a second. Here we go. Sorry, I'm having trouble with this at the moment. Okay. So really, I just want to go back into this slide as we did last time of what is it that over the course of this class today, we learned or that you're gonna take with you. We learned about sh Shabbat. Anything in particular, Dan? Are you muted? You're muted. Um, it, it comes from Genesis and that God rested on the seventh day. Great. What else? There's different ways to celebrate or observe Shabbat. Yeah. Wonderful. Torah, Tanakh, and Talmud, and what makes them different? The, that the Talmud it, it contains the Mishnah and the Gomorrah and that they're commentaries from the early uh, first couple centuries on the Torah itself. Beautiful. Anything else in particular? Well, uh, how the Torah is put together. Yeah. The um, Jewish responsa to answer contemporary or, or questions about contemporary life in Judaism. Yeah, such an important thing that a lot of people don't know about. That there's symbols all over the the synagogue, and our um, Torah covers and everywhere you look. Yeah, I was going to say that a virtual tour of your synagogue, which I appreciated. <laughs> I've never been inside one, <laughs> so it's nice. I've yeah. only zoomed zoomed so far. But. I know it's has been a funny year. And so a lot of us haven't had that chance, at least not in a long time, but some of us haven't at all. How, uh, how Shabbat is celebrated in the synagogue, the different parts of the worship, since I have only participated uh, through Zoom myself. Yeah, it's great. The different ways that Shabbat is celebrated and all of them, depending on um, reformed or conservative or orthodox, um, are different ways to be able to do that in response um, to Shabbat. Right. There are different ways to celebrate and they're all valid. Um, I learned more about the responses. About the responses, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So I know this tour, our discussion um, some more insight into just what Judaism is all about. 
And in two weeks from now, when we come back from our third and final class, we'll be able to talk a bit about Israel and community. And there's definitely a lot more to discuss there. Um, so I look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. If you'd like to be on the Temple email list, And I'm just so grateful for all of your being here, adding um, some of your wisdom to our discussion. Thank you. Re Rabbi Kelsey, would you repeat your answer about what people should do if they'd like to be on the email list because you froze during that I whole explanation? Yeah, but that's uh, okay. All right, just tell me again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. E just email me. Respond to the email that I sent out this morning, last night, whatever that was. Um, let me know that you want to be on the email list and I'll make sure that you are so that you can get information about all of our programs and services and you can come to anything that you'd like to. Rabbi, if you, you have if you have any more links like you did, you sent in, I think it was for tonight, where we get to hear the prayers in Hebrew especially the one done by the children, because if the children can pronounce it, the adults can learn. If you have more links like that, can you share those with us? L links of specific prayers? Yes, in Hebrew, to, just to be, able, to be able to hear it. Yeah, there are some prayers through the Union Reform Judaism even that they posted about like lighting Shabbat candles or things like mm -hmm. that. That might be a good place to start. So I can send that out. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, I definitely feel like um, I'm a prospective convert. I feel like the most intimidating thing is learning Hebrew and reading Hebrew, especially as somebody who, you know, grew up reading Spanish. So that's going to be an undertaking. Yeah, I, it can feel intimidating. And I'll tell you, I am very much not a language person. And so learning Hebrew well enough to be a rabbi, not an easy thing for me to do. Um, but it, the thing about Hebrew, it's a really interesting language. English is super confusing, right? There's all of these roles from out of left field, it feels like sometimes. I mean, they're actually actually are reasons for a lot of the various spellings and things, but it's much more confusing. Hebrew tends to have specific like roots of letters. And once you get to know some of the basics, it becomes actually pretty easy to go into the like rhythm of things. So I know it sounds super intimidating right now to get to know a new alphabet, a new alphabet of 22 letters. I promise you it's not as scary as it sounds. Okay. And when I do an intro to Judaism class next year, there will be an, a component of it that will allow for people to learn um, how to read some basic Hebrew. So if that's something that interests you, know that that's going to be something on the horizon. And when we have our next class, that class will already be posted on the Union Reform Judaism site. And I'll make sure that you all have that information should you want to be a part of it. Okay, thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. And I know my bandwidth has not been great tonight. So thank you for bearing with me at times that it hasn't. I hope you all have a really wonderful evening. You too, thank Rabbi. You. Thank you. Great, great thank, class. You. thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, Rabbi. Good night. Thank you, Rabbi.